Hello, everyone. Thank you all for staying for the very last talk. I realize this is a black screen, and my name is Hannah, and I study the sense of touch. So I want you all to imagine you have a backpack in front of you. Let's say it has a notebook in it. It has some pens, a pencil, your keys, a water bottle, amongst other things. And I ask you to reach in there and pull out a pen. I'm sure all of us could very easily do this task. You could even differentiate between a pen and a pencil without even looking, just using your fingers. And that's because we as humans have a very highly sophisticated sense of touch. Because we have a very highly sophisticated sense of touch, we can rely on touch when we don't have vision to actually see. And it's this reason, this seeing without looking, makes us so special. Robots are not quite as special as us. And so here I'm going to show you a video from Boston Dynamics. This is Atlas. It's a very, very highly sophisticated robot. And what you're going to see is Atlas is trying to put this box on a shelf. And he doesn't have the sense of touch. And so he just immediately fails at this task. And that's because he doesn't have any feedback. He can't feel that he dropped the box. He can't feel that the shelf is here. And he just ends up falling over in the end, <laughs> which is really, really sad. And so if robots, such as Atlas, who is state of the art, can't even use the sense of touch, how can we rely on him to do a task like pipe maintenance, where potentially it's very dusty? Like firefighting, where there's smoke and he might not be able to see. Or cave excavation, where it might be muddy waters. And it's these very dangerous jobs that we really need to be autonomous today, but we can't re yet rely on robots to do. And that's where I come in. And so what I'm currently working on is developing a system to give robots this same sense of touch, to allow them to see without actually looking, just using their fingers. And so, how do I do that, you might ask? Well, nature has provided one unifying expert for the sense of touch. And that expert is probably not one you would expect. So yes, I study rats. And specifically, I study rat whiskers. And the name of my talk is A Whisk of Hair, Developing Biomimetic touch, Whisker-like Touch Sensors. See, rats exist in these types of hazardous environments. They exist in environments that are muddy, that are dirty, that are dusty, where they can't rely on their vision to actually see and they have to rely on their whiskers. So whiskers, for those of you who don't know, are stiff hairs that stick out of the face of the rat. And they move these whiskers. I'm going to play you a video, because what kind of a talk about animals would this be if you didn't see a video of a rat? And so in this video, you'll see this rat is moving her whiskers backward and forward in a motion called whisking. Another thing you should notice is that she's putting her whiskers specifically in places she hasn't been in before to try to explore her environment. Imagine that you're in a dark room, for instance. The first thing you do is you stick out your hands. That's exactly what the rat is using. And she would often use her whiskers and hold them against different objects to help her navigate it in the dark. And that's essentially what I want to do. And in this cartoon, I have whiskers drawn on a drone. And the idea here is that the drone would be able to navigate in this type of dusty environment using its whiskers. And so obviously, vision is a great system. We don't close our eyes if we have to. But in situations where you won't be able to see, the idea is that you'd be able to use whiskers as a backup system. So how do I do this? Well, to, do, to answer that question, we have to give you guys a crash course in whiskers. So this is a profile of a rat. And you might notice that there's 30 black dots on that rat's face. And those are where all of the whiskers on that one side of the rat's face originate. That's right, there's 30 whiskers per each side of a rat face, 60 total. That's a lot of whiskers. And each whisker has a unique shape and size that has been optimized for sensing. So let's pick just one whisker. What does that look like? Well, it can be broken down into two different parts. There's the whisker itself which is a stiff hair. And there's also the follicle sinus complex, which is beneath the skin. And that's actually what does all of the sensing. So in essence, we have an amplifier, which is the whisker, which interacts with the hazardous environment and bends. And then we have the sensor, which is the follicle sinus complex, which converts everything that the whisker experiences into a code that can be read by our brain. So if we want to make a mechanical whisker, we should do something similar. And so in this picture, we have a white whisker, which you can see at the bottom, that's very long. It interacts with the environment and can touch the different kinds of hazardous environments that we want our whiskers to be useful in. And we also have a sensor at the base. And this sensor is designed to accurately measure 3D bending in a way that we can then interpret. So what does that look like? What is at the core of the sensor? Well, the core has a cross. And on it are string gauges, which, is, which essentially measure deflections. As the whisker bends, the cross also bends. The strain gauge is bent, and we have a signal that we can use. To illustrate it, I have color-coded the cross in different colors. So imagine we push the whisker in one direction. That signal will probably look like something made up of the blue and the yellow arms of the cross. We push it in the other direction, 
And that's going to be some signal made up of the green and the red arms of the cross. Well, what if we push it straight down? Well, that's going to be a combination of all four arms of the cross. And it turns out we can use these three signals, bending and also pushing straight down at the whisker, to uniquely map to a 3D contact point in space. And so this is work that has been shown before. And using a little bit of machine learning, we can do that. We can create that mapping and actually map out points on a cone, for instance, or put it on a robot and actually have that map the space in the world. Now, whoa. All of you are probably thinking, oh my gosh, I had no idea whiskers were so cool. What else can whiskers do? And I am here to tell you that they can do so much more than this, specifically flow sensing. So I picked out two of my favorite marine mammals, which are experts in flow sensing, the harbor seal on the left here and the sea lion on the right. And they are beautifully modeling their unique and gorgeous whisker arrays for you guys. Just like I showed you a video of a rat, I'm going to show you a picture, a video of a harbor seal. So here is a swimming pool. And inside the swimming pool is a robotic fish that I've highlighted. And that robotic fish is going to go off and swim off in some trajectory, which is drawn out here for you guys. And what's going to happen is a harbor seal, which is blindfolded and earmuffed, is going to follow the exact trajectory left by that robotic fish. So here the fish goes. It goes off in some trajectory. And then the harbor seal will be released. And I'm going to remind you that that harbor seal is blindfolded and is following the exact trajectory left by that fish just using its whiskers. So this is, of course, amazing. And you're probably thinking to yourself, what is it about the harbor seal and its whiskers that allows it to do this? And to that, I have to say that every animal is different. And each whisker array is different and optimized for its particular task. So while the rat is an expert in tactile sensation, it, has, it holds its array up in the air. Its whiskers are sort of up in the air and exploring the world, whereas the sea lion and the harbor seal are maybe a little bit more turned down, right? And this makes them perfect for flow sensing, perhaps. Another great thing to note is that every whisker is different. And there's a beautiful optimization shown here. So the rats have a circular cross-section. A rat whisker is just pretty uniform throughout its entire length. But the harbor seal whisker has undulations all along its length. And this helps it in flow sensing in particular. And so I just want to end this talk, and actually the symposium, with this idea that nature is an excellent optimizer. And we can use the lessons we learn from nature to create really sophisticated and highly advanced systems to do tasks that are really complex that robots can't yet do. And maybe if we take this lesson from nature and develop a sensor that is specialized for this task, we can give robots the ability to see without actually looking at what they're seeing. Thank you for listening.